don't have my clicker to change the slides. Let me just do that. OK. So first, when is somebody, oh, first, let me just lay it out a little bit further for you. I've laid out some low and high bars for aging. And as you can get a sense, I go for the high bars. The low bars were always, I think, fine, and up, but today we can do better. The low bar might be manage the diseases of late life, but the high bar is prevent them. And we know now that multiple chronic conditions are the lot of people when they get to certain ages. Another low bar would have been to preserve function. But we know now that that's not ambitious enough. The idea is to enhance function, enhance thinking, moving, and feeling, which you're going to hear about today. We can build reserve, because we've learned enough about neuroscience and physical function that there's many, many opportunities, some through engineering solutions, some through other solutions, to enhance thinking, feeling, and moving. And finally, I think we used to be satisfied with protecting the elderly. But I think also that's too low a bar. We want to engage or make it easier for people to participate in work, the arts, family, travel, activity. So all of these things, I think, are legitimate goals for us today, learning what we know now about age. The first one really requires partnerships with physicians and better medications. And I won't talk too much about that. The bottom one here really is more of a policy and society issue. And I won't talk too much about that either. Uh, I have been very impressed myself how under-challenged older people are in some cases, or 70s and 80s, who don't have the opportunities to do things they want to do. It's the middle thing that I'd like to talk about today. That's the sweet spot. We can't assume that just by managing or preventing chronic conditions, these things will take care of themselves. For this, we need active partnerships between public health, older people, aging services, and many other dimensions. So let me go on then and talk a little bit about the background. I don't know if you can see this so well. But the first question is, when are we old? <laughs> what age do you think we are old? Is it obvious? I was talking to some people here. They guessed my age quite well. We can t uh, guess people's ages pretty accurately, I think, certainly within the same decade. Uh, but one of the curious things about when age, when you think someone is old, is that it depends very much on your own age. It's always a lot older than what you are. So these 18 to 22 year olds think old age begins at about age 50 or age 48. Okay, And these 55 year olds think old age begins at 65 and 70. And the 75 to 85 year olds think it begins at about age 75. So what do you think? It's one of those interesting things. There's also something curious. Uh, women are a little more charitable than men when it comes to descriptions of when old age begins. So if you take 55-year-olds, women think old age begins at about age 70, and men think it begins at about age 65. So there are some uh, interesting features there. The other thing we know is that the world is getting older very quickly. And it's not just countries like the United States. It's also the developing world. By 2050, a quarter of our population will be over age 65. But in Africa, it'll also be about 15%. So aging is not limited to just the more developed countries. And one of the hazards of success, as John mentioned, if you cure infectious diseases and reduce infant mortality, uh, you're going to have a lot more older people. And we have to consider the chronic diseases and disabilities that come with old age. And that's quite evident here. <clears throat> Death rates continue to fall. Uh, we pay attention to this one, the age-adjusted rate. Uh, w uh, at one time, about 1,300 people of every 100,000 died per year in the United States. Now it's down to about 850 and continuing to decline. So if you start to reduce deaths, you're going to have older populations. And that's what's shown here. Our life expectancy continues to increase. 
We still have disparities. It's better to be a white female than a white male. Better to be a white female than certainly than to be a black male. But everybody seems to be uh, increasing the likelihood of reaching very old age. And that leads us to the risk of death. <coughs> we usually, this is a pattern you see in every human population. In fact, you see it in every mammalian population. Risk, increased risk about birth flat until you get to about the early part of old age and then a very steep increase in the risk of dying. Uh, for our purposes, we want to pay attention to two challenges to what I call the better old age. One is premature mortality, people who die before they're 65. Another is the disability that comes with very old ages. And it's an interesting thing. My colleague Lou Culler at the Division of the Department of Epidemiology at Pitt makes a big distinction between people who get cognitive impairment in their 70s and people who get cognitive impairment in their 80s. Uh, we worry more about cognitive impairment in people in their 70s. If we could delay that until they get to their 80s, we would all be a lot happier. And many of those people might die of other things and avoid Alzheimer's disease entirely. So, we worry about these sorts of things, premature mortality and disability, and I want to talk about both of those. First, uh, I don't think you might be able to read that so well, but I just want to tell you that reaching age 90 is not so rare anymore. Do we have any folks over 90 in the audience who will admit it? There's one, two, three, four. It's not rare. There was a time where you never, oh, five where you never saw someone over age 90. In 1960, when my sister was born, I'm actually a little older than that, only 7,000 out of 100,000 people would, each, would reach age 90. But today, for people born in 2004, 22% of them are likely to reach age 90. It's going to be very common at some point. <coughs> And so we're going to see a lot more of this. This is an engraving from a Buddhist temple in Thailand. Uh, it's a picture of the human lifespan. You might call it a model of the lifespan. Can you make it out? Here's the baby just born. Here's the man with a girlfriend or fiance. Here they have a child. Then the women disappear. It's just a man's world. Here's the man holding a parchment. He's a professional. And here he is at the pinnacle of his career, standing at the top. He's now a community leader, statesman. And then it's all downhill. You can see him with a cane over here, but still looking pretty good. Then he gets a little more stooped. His body changes. He, uh, uh, more and more stooped until finally he's near death at the lowest uh, rung, uh, rung there. And uh, in fact, he dies and is reincarnated perhaps as a child and you have the cycle again. And, and we're, we're talking here, when we talk about aging in public health, we're talking about this, which I have called the second 50 years. And one thing we've learned a lot about is the first 50 years make a big difference for how you experience the second 50 years. And I can talk a little bit about that later. But first, let me show you what happens when you enter the second 50 years. Well, the first thing is we slow down. We slow down in moving. We slow down in thinking. And I would say we slow down in feeling as well. And I'll come back to that. Look at what happens if you start to slow down. Uh, here is a distribution of walking time. We just make people walk four meters along a line. We time them, make, it, make them do it two or three times. We say, just go at your normal pace. Okay, about 22% of those people walk fast. They can walk more faster than one meter per second. And that's a good number because that's about what you need to cross the street with a traffic light in the United States. Everybody else doesn't walk that fast. In fact, 5% of this group of people over age 70 can't walk at all. They, they're not steady enough for walking. 
And what you notice here is this is the risk of dying associated with those walking ability. The faster you walk, the lower your risk of death over four years of follow-up in this particular study. So what we want to do is keep people moving. And we have some very interesting clinical trials now designed to see if we can increase the speed at which older people walk. And if you increase that speed, we think people will not fall as often. But we also think their memory function might be better. They might stay out of the hospital more. What is the intervention that leads to people walking faster? What do you think? I hate to say it. It's plain old exercise. Nothing fancy. So these are the sorts of things we'd like we're working on right now. Here's another one, grip strength. We give people hand dynamometers. Have any of you ever seen these things? You squeeze it. It doesn't matter how much you grunt. It doesn't matter how you psychologically prepare yourself. You give it a squeeze, and it records how many kilograms of force you can generate. Look at how it declines with age, male and female. And it's one of those iron laws of gerontology. You know, we have the iron law of demography, which is that with each chronological year of time, you get one year older. <laughs> well, we have the iron law of gerontology. With each one year of time, your grip strength declines a little bit, unfortunately. And we even have evidence that people's grip strength in their 50s is a very good predictor of what they look like in their 70s. That is their risk of reaching the 70s or being in a nursing home or having disability with cooking, cleaning, shopping, grooming, bathing. All of those things are fairly nicely predicted by how strong your grip is at age 50. We also have some evidence that this measure is very, very variable across the world. I compared a group of New York City older people to a group of New Delhi residents in India. And the New York City elderly looked a lot better on the grip strength measure, I will tell you. Things like lifelong nutritional deprivation, very back-breaking severe occupational labor, and other sorts of things really take a hit on how people will experience old age. So that's the bad, some of the bad stuff. Let me show you a little more of the bad stuff, just in case you don't believe me. This is a part of the Wexler logical memory test. Have any of you ever had cognitive assessments? You know, uh, John was making fun. They say, can you subtract 7 from 100? Now do it again, now do it again. How do you spell the word world backward? Well, we give you a few things to remember, and we distract you for 20 minutes and see if you remember them. Well, this is one of those tests. Can you read that? Anna Thompson of South Boston, employed as a scrub woman in an office building, reported at the City Hall station that she had been held up the night before on State Street and robbed of $15. She had four little children, the rent was due, and they had not eaten for two days. The officers, touched by the woman's story, made up a purse for her. Now, we don't speak like this today, right? This is probably from England, right? Make up a purse. What does that mean, make up a purse? Collect money, right? And what's a scrub woman? Custodian, right? Something like this. And when I show this to my students today, they scratch their head. They don't really get it. But what we, there are a lot of facts in this story, OK? We then take this away, and we ask people to report back as many facts about this as they can. And you can see, where did this happen? South Boston. What was the woman's job? Scrub woman. Uh, what happened to her? She was robbed. How many children does she have? Two. Right? Well, four. Whoops. Four. <laughs> Just checking to see if you're paying attention. OK. And this is what we find. This is the number of facts people remember, stratified by whether they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s. Well, if you're in your 30s, you remember, on average, about eight facts. If you're in your 40s, about seven. If you're in your 50s, a little less than six. If you're in your 60s, a little less than six. And if you're in your 70s, four. And the most important thing, the frightening thing to people like me who are in their 50s, is that, guess what? Already in your 50s, memory performance is beginning to decline. 